Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to your Lunch Break Live. Today is Tuesday. My name is Ivana, if you are new here. And today we have a really special guest here. Uh, today I'm joined by the Alabama Republican Party Chairman Terry Lathan. She is here today to answer some questions that I know you all have regarding uh, the elections coming up next week. It's hard to believe it's almost November 3rd and uh, it's hard to believe 2020 is, is kind of coming to a close. I think we can all be happy about that one. So uh, today, Terry's joining us. If y'all have questions, please let us know. You sent some wonderful ones via social media and our email yesterday, so we appreciate it. But Terry, let's let's jump right in. Thank you for so, so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. I know that uh, it is, you know, it's kind of a cloudy day. It's overcast, and uh, you know we got some bad weather coming in. So I appreciate you not sleeping in and, and taking, yeah. you know, taking our invitation today. Well, I live in Mobile, so we we check the weather quite frequently down here when we have another storm coming. So and it seems to shift a little bit our way. So we're watching. Well, we're we hope you and, and everybody down there is is staying safe. Yeah. Uh, let you know. Let's let's first talk about something that I think is on a lot of people's minds after last night, and that is the confirmation of now Justice Amy Coney Barrett. Right now, Senator Doug Jones released a statement last night saying. The confirmation of now Justice Barrett to the Supreme Court, quote, has been one of the most blatantly hypocritical in the history of the Senate, end quote. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that Senator Shelby and then Senator Sessions did not uh, consider Merrick Garland's nomination in March of 2016. They went along with the Republican thinking that that was uh, they, that the next president should fill that vacancy. And that was in March of 2016. So what do you think about Senator Jones's comment? And is now Justice Barrett's confirmation, is that hypocritical? Sure. So a couple things. I think that was done in 2016 that they, they said that there was a history in the United States Senate. It's not a law. It's not a rule or guideline. It's more of a guideline. That when you have two power, when you have the uh, White House and the Senate in conflict, in other words, you have two, uh, one's a Republican, one's in, in the Democrat control, that as a rule that they would do that. So there was an election in 2018, and, and the people spoke very loudly in 2018. In fact, the U.S. Senate picked up two extra seats, and that was about the time all the Obamacare things were going on, and people were just furious about Obamacare. So if they weren't, we, we would not have picked up two seats in the United States Senate in, in 2018. So we had an election in 2016. We heard the people very loudly there. We had election in 2018. We picked up more seats in the United States Senate. And so here we are at 2020. Now, the Constitution, though, is very clear, the Founding Fathers. This was their directions to us. They didn't really put any rules or guidelines down on it, but it says it is the president's responsibility to choose the Senate to confirm. And that's exactly what happened. They followed the Constitution. Well, then, you know, just to follow up on that, though, then in 2016, what was the Republican push to not consider the nomination of Merrick Garland then? But now just our one week today, eight days last night from election, that's a lot sooner than March of 2016 was for, for Merrick Garland. Now for Justice Amy Coney Barrett, that's a very uh, that's a very close to the election sure. confirmation. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's no denying that, but you also have the United States Senate in power with the Republicans at this time. The difference is you have the White House in control of the Republicans. So therefore, you have those two things matching. The history has shown in the U.S. Senate, if one was out of power, if there were two separate parties, um, that there was uh, in the past that they, they have waited somewhat. Um, so I think that's the thinking on that. And we also did have an election in 2016. We had one in 2018 and the people spoke very clearly in both of those elections. Now, moving moving on a little bit to something that is ahead of next week's election, and that is a lot of things people have said on social media that they wish they could have seen a little bit more public forum, a little bit more debating between candidates. Mm -hmm. Now, a Republican that is running for statewide office has not agreed to debate their Democratic opponent since 2010. Mm -hmm. Now, some candidates don't participate in, in primary debates either. So do you think that it is important for candidates and for voters, rather, to hear from their candidates on a larger platform, on a bigger forum than just going to a campaign event, just going to a campaign website. And 
even if not in the general election, do you encourage debates for the primaries? Yeah, I mean, I think it's important. I don't have a problem with that at all. Um, party decision to make, it's a campaign decision to make. Terry, I think we are losing your audio just a little bit. Um, we, uh, what, what I believe you said was that I think we're having a little bit of trouble there. But I think what uh, what you had said, if anybody didn't hear it, was that you didn't have a problem with that. And uh, but that was a that's a campaign decision for the candidates. Terry, this is, I know we're having a, we're having a few technical issues here. So this yeah. is what I'm going to do. If you can hear me, I'm going to kick, I'm going to kick you out. And uh, if you could just rejoin us here in a second and uh, hopefully yeah. our connection will, will improve. So I'm going to kick Terry out for just a second. She's going to rejoin us here. This is just a technical issue, but uh, we, what we have been talking about so far was Amy Coney Barrett and her confirmation. And then uh, we were just talking about debates. And if you didn't hear the, uh, the chairwoman, she said, that she believed that, you know, she didn't have a problem with those debates, but she said that it was a campaign and a candidate decision. So we are waiting for Terry to get joined again. And I am going to check my uh, my phone here to make sure she's not calling or having any other issues. And um, we will get her back on in just a second. Bear with us here. And uh, we, I'm going to take a second to just remind everybody this is 2020. We're all working from home. We're all having technology issues. So we, we will give, you know, the, the, give the chairwoman that. She's trying to get her connection, get her connection working and, and get back here and take some of these questions. And in the meantime, while I'm trying to get with her via phone to make sure she can get back. In the meantime, y'all send me, if you have any questions for Terry, send them on. If you have any questions uh, tomorrow, I will be chatting with Senator Jones. If you have any questions for Senator Jones, please bring them on and uh, let me know. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear what kind of questions you want be, you want to be answered from the Senator. Um, I know a lot of people really wanted to ask Terry about that debate question that we were just talking about before she broke up. And then um, I know we wanted to talk about the confirmation. So it looks like we have uh, Terry back here. Terry, can you hear us? I can. How about yourself? I can hear you. So here is what we are. Here's what we're going to do, guys. Now, we are we do not have the video for Terry, but we have her voice. So that is the main thing here. We can hear her answers. So Perfect. thank you so much, Terry, for bearing with us. Yeah, Terry, sorry about that. You are fine. It's 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 not your fault. It is a connection issue. So uh, I will let you go ahead and repeat your answer about the debates. Sure. Look, I, it's a campaign. Campaigns make their own decisions. Some are going to do it. Some may not do it. They look at everything very analytical. They look at it in in pieces. What's best? What's not best? So it's hard for me to say yes, someone should or no, they shouldn't. It really is an individual uh, responsibility and an individual candidate um, situation to do. I mean, we have a lot of these all over the state. A lot of times in the counties, we have them. We've had congressional. We've had gubernatorial. Um, it's been a long time with the U.S. Senate race. Uh, it, you know, we, we rarely have those, to tell you the truth. But we did find ourselves where we had one. I know the GOP primary with uh, Roy Moore and Luther Strange. So it depends upon the campaign to tell you the truth and they make those decisions. Would you like to hear from uh, the, uh, from at least candidates in the primaries before, or if you were a voter and, and you can understand the voter's perspective of saying, look, I sure. want to know my, my candidates, especially in the primaries. Sure. Um, you know, the primaries, at least in our state, it's real interesting because we're such a Republican red state the voters do seem to find out. They seem to step in. There are a lot of them that really do like debates, but if you look at the numbers and people who vote, most of them don't go to a debate. Most of them don't watch a debate, and most of them do not read about a debate. 
It's interesting how voters will make their decisions for, for many different reasons. But I would say if voting, the numbers do not match how many people are involved, watch, or listen to a debate at all. But somehow, some way, the voters, they see things on peripheral, they research, they find things, and they make their decisions. Now, let's let's shift a little bit to coronavirus. I know that is something that is hard to ignore in 2020, and uh, it's going to be hard to ignore, unfortunately, for the next couple of months to come. So mm. President Trump has been criticized for his handling of the p- coronavirus pandemic. But how do you think he has handled the pandemic? And do you think he could have done anything differently to save American lives? Well, first of all, I think the criticism is coming from a lot of the mainstream media, you know. It does. We, we every day we hear and we see what people um, allow us to see in the in the national news. I mean, we're we, here. We are in a statewide organization talking with you right now, and I'm very appreciative for this time. But the national media is on a different level, and they decide what we see and what we hear. And they are very, very good at putting their thumb on the scale um, against President Trump. I, I don't even think they deny it anymore, to tell you the truth. So when it comes to the COVID situation, if you look at what he did as fast as he did and moved the pieces around as quickly as he did with a pandemic that nobody saw coming. I mean, nobody saw this coming whatsoever. I'm not real sure. You let, Let's reverse this. I was talking to someone the other day and I thought, you know, what if Joe Biden had been the president and what if this pandemic had? So you have a 44 uh, year bureaucrat that's got to go through government, red tape, and issues making those types of decisions. What would you do any differently? In fact, what's really interesting is he's actually said, here's what I would have done. Here's what we should do. We're already doing it. He's literally copying the Trump plan. So I find that to be a false narrative, to tell you the truth. Um, The president closed China as fast as anyone. And as we may recall, Joe Biden said he shouldn't have done that. The Democrats had a fit. They said that should not have been done. But he did it. And now they're like, well, you didn't do it soon enough. You shouldn't have done it all first. Oh, you didn't do it soon enough. So it does, I mean, it just doesn't matter when it comes to this. They're going to parse this to death. And they're just wrong. He moved those mercy ships as fast as anyone could, got hospitals up, got the PPE, the PPPs, and all the alphabets, everything we need as fast as we could, remembering that nobody saw this pandemic coming. And they're still on moving, moving, moving things as fast as they can. So it's a very, it's a tough situation. I'll tell you what, I'd much rather had a businessman CEO who knows how to get things done at the helm of the organization with the whole world watching than a bureaucrat sitting there trying to figure out if they need a committee or not or cutting red tape and going through the bureaucracy of the United States government. Let me follow up a little bit on that. You said nobody saw this coming. Well, we we know that in uh, the first case in at least Alabama hit in early March, I believe it was around the March, uh, March 14th region. Um, we do know that in the early part of the year between January and February, we do know that the president was uh, cited telling a journalist that he he knew this was coming essentially and he was downplaying it. So what are your, you know, when you say that he didn't know and, and that we didn't know it was coming, uh, how do you how do you reconcile that with knowing that this was at least a problem overseas and that the president might have had an idea that this could be a really serious issue? Well, Yeah, I mean, I'm not privy to those conversations of what he did or didn't know, but I think what I say didn't know is overall what it it was going to do and how it was going to take off. You know, the people who are responsible for this is is China. That, you know, no one ever seems to really talk about that. They all seem to go, want to point a finger at Donald Trump. And so we know where it came from. We know what the cause was for sure. So again, I wasn't privy to those conversations, but I do believe He listened and moved as fast as he possibly could once you have all the pieces there. And, you know, we still got doctors. One doctor says, do this. One doctor says, no, do this. As of today, I mean, that is still happening across the nation. So, again, it's not a very black and white subject. It is a moving beast. It really is. And the question is, at the time, who would have been best to handle it? Now, we will never know because we only had one president at the time. But I really do think he moved as fast as he possibly humanly could. And again, I will reiterate, it it, it scares me beyond words to think that a, a, a bureaucrat 
um, such as Joe Biden, who is so federally united, a government mandated just this, that that's his path all his life, would be in charge if something like this happened. I'm glad you, you mentioned doctors. Let's pivot a little bit on coronavirus, but talk about masks. Now, Governor Ivey has been much more uh, hard-lined on masks than a lot of her Republican governor colleagues. What do you and uh, what does the party believe about the mask mandate in Alabama? Should that mask mandate continue? And uh, do you believe that there we should be encouraging people to wear masks right now? You know, I have to tell you, this is um, this question is almost asking me, do you pull for Alabama or Auburn? It depends upon <laughs> who you ask. There are a lot of Republicans that are just adamantly opposed to this and they still fight it today. But there are also Republicans and I see I hear them. They tell me that they think this is a good thing to do and that, you know, maybe we're in a better place. So. I, it really depends upon you who you ask. The Alabama Republican Party has not necessarily, we've not taken a stance on this. You know, this is a legislative process. This is an executive process with the governor and her team. Again, not privy to those conversations and looking at the science. So I have to tell you, Ivana, it kind of depends upon who you ask. Some are for it and some are against it. What do you believe? Um, you know, I do like to try to follow the science personally myself, and I wear a mask when I go out. Sometimes if I'm speaking, sometimes if I'm at something that I might take it off, you might see a picture of me without it on, but I can promise you it's in my hand. And I, I do use it as much as I possibly can, but that's just my personal preference. It's not a political statement. Now, let's, you know, let's shift a little bit to some topics that are really important for voters right now or seem to be very important for voters ahead of this election that is next week. Again, it seems wild to say that, that the election is next week. But it does. <laughs> we know that we know that racial inequality is a huge issue in America. And it's a, we're hearing a lot about that right now. People of color are concerned for their kids, particularly for black teens or for black young men. Do you perceive differences in the way that law is enforced based on racial lines? And, and if you do, what do you think needs to happen to fix that problem? Well, I don't think this is a one size fits all answer. I think this is a very, you have to look at each incident and we've seen some incidents and they're not good and they need to be corrected immediately. And by the way, we've always had incidents that, like we've seen and we're going to in the future as well. When you have human beings involved, you're gonna have some mostly great ones and you're going to have some that absolutely get it wrong. And so when those those things happen, we need to deal with them. Of course, we need to deal with them. But I really don't see that it's a one size fits all. And I am horrified at people talking about defunding the police and they're your enemy. No, they're not. In fact, they're the first people that we're going to call. I bet the same people who think like that, and mostly it's Democrats, and we see them on television, we read their words. That one, and in fact, I heard Joe Biden myself say, yes, defund the police and take, put the money in other places. Now, he denies he said it. I mean, he, he denies a lot of things he says on tape. But I saw Joe Biden um, say that myself personally. And, you know, look, they, they, they say what they mean and mean what they say. So, look, I, I, it is hard. If I'm very honest, it is very hard for me to understand that walk because I'm not African-American. And but I understand compassion and I understand the laws and I understand humanity and I understand uh, police officers who are amazing, amazing people. And then you're going to have some that don't do the right thing. And those are the ones that need to be taken care of. But it's just not a one size fits all. It's just not. Now, if you take a te television camera and you aim it at a situation or two or three and you broadcast it 24 seven, the perception is that it really is like that. But the fact of the matter is, I think most people listening here and most of us will go through our lives and not experience those things. So I would also say, if I'm to be very honest, that if you look at some of the situations, people are not following the laws. They're not listening to the police officers, they're not following the laws. But again, there are exceptions to the rules. And the ones that are exceptions to the rules should be taken care of, taken out, and absolutely handled. 
Um, you know, I, I'm sorry, I was looking through some of the comments. I wanted to quickly clarify, there's a comment from Alan talking about two Alabama GOP women. I just want to quickly clarify that um, I am, I'm a reporter and I am working here for AL.com. I am just interviewing the, the Alabama GOP chairwoman. I just want to quickly qualify that. And Terry uh, is, <laughs> is obviously not on camera at the moment. We're having a little technical issues, but this is, uh, this is our audio coming through. Her video got a little <laughs> bit stuck, but we, we can forgive her on that. We all understand that problem, but getting back to kind of that conversation, there, you know, there's a huge population in Alabama that is non-white and there's a huge minority population. How do how can the Republican Party relate to the minority population and get Republican voters, turn voters Republican in uh, areas and maybe groups that are not traditionally and do not historically vote Republican? Yeah. What can the party say to those people to say, hey, come vote with us. And these are these are our policies. This is what we want to do. And this is how it's going to help you. Right. Well, you know, it's that is a great question. And we line up in policy. Uh, with the African American community, through in, in very strong suits. The problem is that message is not getting through. For example, one of the biggest things the African American community is for and fight for and want is school choice. Well, the Republican Party is a school choice. I mean, we wrote the laws for school choice. We don't think that a child should be go to a school because of their zip code. We think the parent knows best with their child, not a government bureaucracy or a government official. We believe that the parents pay the taxes and therefore they should send their child to the school of their choice, whether it's public, parochial or private. Again, it's their child, their money. So that's one of the number one issues on a, a policy. So the Republican Party and the African-American community absolutely go hand in glove in. But our message doesn't get out very much um, on, on that. And I think there's, there's several different reasons for that. Another one is the pro-life issue. We line up very strongly the African-American community with pro-life. And good grief, the Republican Party is the pro-life party. And uh, on a traditional marriage, I have to say the numbers show that in the African-American community that they very favorable traditional marriage type of family. Well, so does the Republican Party. So if you want to talk about policies, those are things we absolutely line up with. I think the question is, why isn't that message getting out there? I would go back to a great degree to the megaphones in our society or our media, to be quite honest with you. And so while we talk about these things or we go out of the community, we share these things, the message sometimes does not break through. Um, I also will be honest with you, Ivana, and tell you I've had many, many African Americans in Alabama tell me I vote Republican or I'd like to come to a Republican meeting or I believe in those the policies. You're right on. But I would be ostracized from my, my family. I would be ostracized from my friends or my church if they find out. And so I have to tell you, those words to me bother me as much as anything in politics, because they should be able to feel like they have the freedom to say their opinion and stand on their opinion. And, and those words, when I hear them, they, they greatly bother me. They're heavy on my heart. Question about uh, about the president and, and ahead of his uh, obviously running for re-election next week. Now, Republicans in Alabama very much value religious liberty. Many are Christians. And there are those people who look at Trump and say, his character doesn't really line up with my beliefs. So what do you say to those voters that are going to the polling places and thinking, do I vote for somebody who maybe we have the same policy ideas, but their character doesn't really line up with my beliefs and, and what, I, what I feel uh, the head of our nation should act like? Yes, I've heard that before and I've seen that. And, I, you know, honestly, uh, I think that question is broken through the mainstream. I think I would say to that, <clears throat> excuse me, there are some things, honestly, personally, I'll speak for myself, that sometimes I don't like the way the president may say something. I don't. I think there's better ways to say it and do it. However, when I go into a voting booth and I pick my pen up and I put it down on a name or put it down on a party, 
The machine doesn't know my emotions. It's just a calculating machine. But what, what people understand is the outcome of that paper. And so if we go in and say, you know, I don't like the way he says this or, or acts some, sometimes, in, in, and I, honestly, Donald Trump was one of the most vetted candidates in 2016. He, this is no surprise to anybody. It shouldn't be if, if some folks are uncomfortable with some of the things how he acts or says. But, but what, what the people are saying when they vote for him that say, you know, I'm going to put that aside because he appoints conservative justices to the Supreme Court because he says, oh, no, you are, y'all are going to follow the law. If you don't like the law, change the law. But you're not going to, you're going to quit breaking the laws. So that's what that ink on that paper says. There is a personality versus policy. And I hope people will go and vote on policy because that, it, that is what uh, defines our nation. And that's what forms our nation. So you have a man that may be flawed in his character or the way he speaks to people, but what does he do in policy? He's building a border wall. He's saying, no, we're going to control the borders of the United States of America. You are going to follow our laws, folks. Uh, how about tax cuts? Let me give your tax cut money back. Those are the type of things that when you put that that pen down on that paper or pencil and, and, and cast that ballot. Although I do recognize some people will not be able to get past some of the way he says something or a couple words he may use here or there. I'm hoping that they'll look at the big picture down the road for America and the difference their vote makes. And it, it should be about policy, but I understand sometimes people vote on personality. I recognize that. Well, we do, we do know that, especially nationally, Republicans have said in the past, character matters. We look back at, at Bill Clinton and we think about Republicans saying character is very important. So does that mean now that we should be putting it in, in your view and in other uh, state Republicans view, we should be putting character as, as a backseat to what somebody can do politically? No, I, I don't think you should ever do that. I mean, I guess character is going to be in the eye of the beholder. And, you know, with Bill Clinton, that didn't seem to bother people. Democrats go, well, you know. And, and so when you have a Republican in office, all of a sudden they want to lift that up. Look, we can talk about a person's character. But honestly, I think for me, what I hear mostly <laughs> it bugs people about him is, let's say, his tweets or let's say um, some of the verbiage that he uses. But as the president of the United States of America, his policies have been strong. And the people in 2016 said, you know, we want to go a different way. The Republicans said, we, you know, we had 17 very amazing, very highly qualified candidates. And what happened? We leapfrog over 16 great patriots to go to the, the new guy, the, the non-PC guy. And I think some of this talk about character is, you know, Donald Trump is not a very PC guy. But what he does is he has uh, promised things and he's delivered. And isn't that a breath of fresh air? If people want a breath of fresh air, they're saying, man, I, you know, he might get on my nerves, but good grief. He's delivering on what he said. And our country before, before we were hijacked by COVID, we're at the top of our game in every category. Every category across the board, women, entrepreneurs, uh, minorities, Latinos, African-American, the small business owner, every single category had broken records from a man who made promises and did what he said. But there are folks that are bothered by the way he says things. I guess each of us are going to have to look at through that lens when they vote on what's more important to them. You mentioned uh, you mentioned several different mi minority communities and you mentioned women in, in that answer. And we have seen polling that has uh, suggested that there are amounts of suburban women who are leaving the Republican Party. What can you say to those women and, and just to suburban women in general? How do you get them back? Well, I'm not sure that we've lost. You said we've heard we've seen some polling. I'm, I'm always very cautious about answering things about polling. I'd like to know the 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 specifics on quote what quote the polling said i i think uh, mr trump got 52 percent of the women vote if i'm not mistaken in 2016 that doesn't sound like a minority to me 
But look, I understand that that's out there. And I, I would say that I've seen some that that's, uh, you know, kind of chiseled away. And I think some of it is maybe his mannerism. I think for women sometimes that that turns people off, especially women. I understand that. I get that. But at the end of the day, again, when when we go into vote and we look at the names and we think really hard, I hope people will look at policies because it's going to be policy. If we if if we go and we signal, OK, we the country signals with Electoral College, not um, not popular vote, that we're going to go Joe Biden way. What we've just signaled to our nation is, OK, uh, raise our taxes. Forget the forget security at the border, abortion on demand with taxpayer money and own and own and own new Green Deal. And by the way, that's a whole different can of worms on that one. We ain't even touched. That's what they're going to hear. And then we're going to signal. I'm hoping women, men, young, old, black, white, rich, poor, whoever a voter is, that they look beyond these things and they go, what is in the best interest of our nation? That is the big picture for me. And I hope women, uh, my fellow women, uh, will look at it that way. What's best for your family? What's best for safety? How in the, there's two things that we commonly see in talking about polling is security and safety for women. Safety in the law and order division, security in the financial division for their families, their children. I'm a mother. I have children. I have family. Most of us do. I can tell you that over and over and over, there are police departments across the nation that have never endorsed, and they're all endorsing Donald Trump. There's a reason for that. There's a reason for that, and that's important for all of us to know. And the economic, that's the security that we need, especially single moms. They were working hard to keep their family intact. Those tax cuts are important. That money matters in your purses, in your wallets, in your checkbooks. And so I just hope America um, signals the right thing on November the 3rd. And I hope uh, women will look at that. Safety and security is very valuable to all of us. I'm going to, we're, we're going to end here on this one question. I just got from a comment or I'm reading it here from my phone. It's from Corey. And Corey says, no matter who wins the presidential election, what are the Alabama legislative leaders going to do to move the state and Alabamians forward to a better Alabama? Meaning, us not being at the bottom of the list as it relates to education, environmental protection, and a wider spread of economical resources? Yeah. Well, that's a good question, Corey. Um, you know, I'm not a legislator. It's That's not my job and not my position to do. But I do know a little about their world. And I can tell you that they, it's not a part-time job, that they work every day. Uh, they're, quote, part-time paid, but that's farther from the truth. Um, I do know that Alabama, and we don't talk about this much, and so I'm glad you asked, Corey. I do know that Alabama's cut back $1 billion a year in, in wasteful spending. They've cut back in government employees, and, we're, and they're doing the job with the amazing people that do work in the government. Um, we have more state troopers on the road now than we ever have. We have school choice with our schools. So there's a lot that they've done, to be quite honest with you. Um, I look at some of these polls and I'm not polls. I see us you know we're kind of in the bottom in some areas. I'd have to go and look at um, which um, polling that is and what the data says on that. But there's no, by the way, last year, maybe coming in this year, I don't want to misspeak. We have the highest education budget in the history of the state of Alabama, the highest. I know it was last year and I think they're adding more to it this year. And so if we've got the highest in the money coming in, is the money the issue? And so I think that is a big, big question that we need to keep having that conversation about. Because right now, there's never been more money in the education budget in the state of Alabama than we have right now. So listen, I'm a former fifth grade public school teacher, Corey. I've sat in a portable that had leaks in the ceiling I had to put buckets in it. I used my own money. Sometimes it was so cold in there and the heater would be out. We could see our breath in my classroom. So I understand that. Totally understand that. Um, but I can tell you the teachers of this state are doing the very best they can. And I'm going to tell you, shout out to the teachers for having to virtual train right now. 
Uh, I promise you, we, they didn't sign up for that at, <laughs> at the beginning of last year, for sure. And uh, amazing, amazing folks in the classroom and uh, to the parents having to struggle right now. So I feel confident we will get through this. Alabamians are tough folks, and we'll be, be able to get through this. But I am really proud of the Republican legislators and the state constitutional office, the governor, lieutenant governor, that are working for education. Uh, by the way, since the Republicans have taken over in the state in 2010, we have not had educational proration, not one year. There's a reason for that. So we're moving the bar, and we, I think they're doing very good things. But honestly, I, I, they're not going to stop. They're not going to stop until we try to do the very best we can. But I do think that is a big question, and I think the answers are, are pretty big, too. Well, Terry, I'm going to echo echo you there. And just, you know, I, I think we can probably all agree that our teachers are our heroes uh, right now and always, and especially for the all the things they're being asked to do right now. Terry, we thank you for your time in the classroom. I, I know that is uh, that's not an easy job and I do not envy. I do not envy that job whatsoever. Well, I will tell you, Vonna, um, before I became state party chair of one of the reddest states in the nation, one of the biggest executive committees in the nation. <laughs> and the Trumpiest state in the nation. Um, I think uh, being a fifth grade teacher with 110 year olds every day was good fertile training ground for me. <laughs> I can only imagine, <laughs> I, I can only imagine, Terry, that's what I'll say. <laughs> Terry, thank you so much for coming today, giving us an insight here into some of these really, these questions that matter to voters. We really appreciate it. I appreciate you working through your tech issues and uh, and joining us. And either way, I, I appreciate you say not uh, not just leaving us, but coming back and getting us, uh, you know, having this conversation. Well, let's do it again. I, I love the opportunity. I love the questions. I love having, but we these open conversations where people can hear some of the policies of the party and not hear things just through the funnel of a one media outlet. Um, that maybe people are used to going to, which, whichever that way may be. I think it's really important. And I think the voters of Alabama, you know, we're a very Republican state. We're very conservative folks. Um, I'm interested in seeing what happens on November the 3rd. I can promise you this. We're probably going to change the title of Coach Tommy Tuberville into U.S. Senator uh, Tommy Tuberville. Um, so we have someone who listens to the majority of Alabamians. We are looking forward to that day. It's going to be an interesting election day. Thank yes. you so much again, Terry. Everybody, thanks for watching. Uh, tomorrow, please join us for a, another conversation again at 11 a.m., this time with Senator Doug Jones. So please join us for that. Send me your questions. Terry, thanks again. And everybody, we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.